This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Stick around to the end of the video for a special offer they're making available through my channel. So what the hell is this video? Well, some of you may have watched my 2020 year in review where I just talked about the games and events that defined video games in the 20th year of this third millennium. You guys didn't hate that video and I liked it and it made me realize that I miss talking about gaming news. So I'm gonna do that once a week. I'm gonna talk about things that interest me and hopefully you'll find them interesting as well. If the show sucks, we can stop doing it. But for now, let's give it a try. Here's an actual quote from Joseph Farris. You know, that Joseph Farris. In an interview with IGN, he said this. That's a fucking confusing name. What the fuck is going on with Microsoft? They're losing it, man. What the fuck is going on? Like Series S, X, Mex, Next. <laughs> I mean, I can't even get through this. I mean, who knows this? Come on, madness. Call it the Microsoft box and that's it. I don't know, it's a total fucking mess. Trust me, even them, they're confused in their offices. What is this XS? I don't know, what the fuck? <laughs> he collects himself for a second. Anyway, God bless Joseph Farris. In a year where both Microsoft and Sony released brand new consoles, it's very important to remember that Nintendo Switch absolutely crushes them both. Industry analyst Matt Piscatella pointed out that Nintendo Switch was the best-selling hardware platform in units and dollars for both December and the 2020 year. Annual dollar sales of Switch hardware were the second highest for a platform in US history. Only the 2008 dollar sales of Nintendo Wii were higher. In Japan, it's even crazier. GamesIndustry.biz reports that Switch consoles accounted for 86% of the total console sales in Japan in 2020. They sold 6.85 million units compared to Sony, selling a combined 800k PS4s and PS5. I'm gonna guess that the Xbox One sales were like negative, where the six dudes in Japan who bought an Xbox One all traded it in at Akihabara for like three Gundam gacha pools. That's a fair trade in Japan, I think. One of the biggest stories this week was that Star Wars and more broadly Lucasfilm stuff was back on the menu. It started with an announcement from Disney who have formed Lucasfilms Games, a company that won't make games but will oversee gaming related projects. This felt a bit odd at first because Disney and EA currently have an exclusive agreement for Star Wars games in place until 2023. So what's the point of this new entity? What would it be doing? Well, we got the first part of the answer soon after Bethesda announced that they were working on an Indiana Jones game. Machine Games is heading it up. They're the team that worked on Wolfenstein and now they're making an indie game, which, you know, I'm down for that. So long as it doesn't go full Crystal Skull, then we'll be fine. Interesting to note that this is almost certainly going to be an Xbox and PC exclusive since Microsoft now owns Bethesda. If only PlayStation fans had an exclusive title where a scruffy swashbuckler chases down buried treasure and raids tombs. Oh well, bad luck Sony ponies. At least you'll always have bug snacks. Anyway, the news got even more wild when it was revealed that Massive Entertainment, the team behind the Division 1 and 2, are working on an open world Star Wars game. That's big for two reasons. Number one, Massive is making an open world Star Wars game, which given Massive's pedigree means we might be in store for some kind of loot based Star Wars game. I mean, that could really suck, but it could also be really cool if they managed to get it right. The other reason it's big news is because it signals the end of the exclusive agreement between Disney and EA around Star Wars content. Disney Senior Vice President of Global Games and Interactive Experiences, Sean Shoptor, told Wire, EA has been and will continue to be a very strategic and important partner for us going forward, but we did feel like there's room for some others. That's a good thing. Setting the Star Wars IP free means that developers can pitch Lucasfilm games with cool ideas and they could potentially be greenlit. We're going to get more Star Wars games and hopefully they're going to be good, but I do think it's important to recognize that EA's track record with Star Wars wasn't the worst. Yes, Battlefront 2's monetization was spectacularly bad, legendarily bad, but the game itself was good, as was Jedi Fallen Order from Respawn, as was Squadrons from EA Motive. We got some good Star Wars games from EA, and I don't think that that should be forgotten as we cheer the explosion of the exclusive agreement. This is pretty wild. This is a list of the most downloaded PS4 games for 2020 across both North America and Europe. There was one new IP that cracked the top 10, and that was Ghost of Tsushima coming in at number five in North America only. It didn't even make the top 10 in Europe. What's wrong with you Europeans? Are you guys drunk on like cheese or something? Anyway, the fact that this list is dominated by EA Sports and Call of Duty games 
makes me very sad. All right, so I don't like Stadia. I think the business model is shit because your library only exists with Google in the cloud, where stuff like Xbox xCloud or Nvidia's GeForce Now connects to your existing libraries, yada yada. Having said that, Stadia has a cool feature rolling out with Hitman 3. It's called State Share, terrible name, but allows you to share your save state with anyone. So you could be like playing a game and you're up to a specific level or whatever, and you can save that and immediately send that save state to someone else who can in seconds be playing with it with your loadout from that position, etc, etc. So you could have streamers doing that and then you could like play along with them or you could just do that with your mates if you have mates. I don't know, no judgments. I think that streaming tech like this is really cool and it's going to allow for some really interesting forms of engagement in the future. I just think the Stadia's business model sucks. The biggest news this week was the same news that we ended 2020 with. I'm talking, of course, about Cyberpunk. It started with the news that the Polish competition watchdog was investigating CD Projekt Red for, you know, all the lying. Worst case scenario is they get fined 10% of their revenue, which is a lot of money, but it's very unlikely. Next, we had CD Projekt Red co-founder Marcin Iwinski put up an apology video on Twitter. Now, first, he does apologize. He does take responsibility, sort of, and he does say that the decisions were taken by management and not the team of devs and that management are ultimately accountable for the failures. Good start. He then goes on to talk about the idea that many of the issues discovered later on just didn't come up in their testing, which is laughable because every single reviewer, even ones like myself who enjoyed the game, catalogued a huge number of bugs as they went. And that was just the PC version, which was way, way better than the utter catastrophe that players on consoles would have to suffer through. Some commented that this was him throwing his quality assurance team under the bus, which I don't think was quite what was happening. I think he was just trying to create a general air of confusion. Like these issues amorphously wafted undetected through every part of the development process and they couldn't have possibly been foreseen. That's complete bullshit, of course. He makes clear that his team were frantically scrambling up to the buzzer to try and get this game running on consoles. If this was the case, then level with us. You're not gonna miraculously fix everything wrong with this game in the two days before release. And as a result, it's very hard to take this apology seriously. They also released what was probably the vaguest road roadmap in the long and sordid history of video game roadmaps. It got worse for CD Projekt Red this week when Jason Schreier of Bloomberg released his expose on the development process of Cyberpunk. He spoke to 20 current and former CD Projekt Red developers and we learned that the real development of Cyberpunk didn't begin until around 2016 and the E3 demo we saw was really, really fake, since a lot of the systems didn't actually work yet, it was a lot of proof of concept stuff. This mirrors stories we've heard from games like Anthem or Destiny, which were both rebooted multiple times and launched in a pretty disastrous state. City Project Red declined to respond to the story in advance of its publication, but afterwards, the City Project Red head of studio, Adam Badowski, offered a response where he cherry-picked questions, dodging a lot of the more difficult claims around things like crunch culture. If you're gonna respond, you should respond in full, not this. All right, so what was announced or delayed this week? Well, firstly, if you're a League of Legends fan living in the US, you can expect a Wild Rift beta in March. Wild Rift is a mobile League of Legends port and it's already out here in Australia and it's awesome. I've actually been playing it for a few weeks. I cannot believe how authentic it is. Just super impressed by it. It's free to play, of course, and the monetization is very good because it's League of Legends. They just, you know, charge you a couple of bucks per hero, whatever. You can pre-register for this on Android or Apple stores. Outriders, the new not live service looter shooter from People Can Fly was going to be released in Feb, has since been pushed to April 1st. The good news is that we get a demo of the game on the 25th of Feb, which tells me that they have a lot of confidence in their product because who does demos these days? I don't know, I just get good vibes from this, especially with their recent PC specs video, which showed a lot of transparency and really spoke to us as gamers rather than just consumers. Elite Dangerous has a massive expansion coming this year called Odyssey. It was meant to be out pretty soon, but it has been pushed to late American spring, which is like late May, basically. It's gonna allow you to get out of the ship for the first time. I've never played Elite, but I've always wanted to, and I definitely plan to check this out when the update hits. Ubisoft's Riders Republic got pushed from a February release until like later this year, no date. I don't think there's a lot of hype for this game, but yeah, Ubisoft seemed to have a thing for extreme sports, so best of luck to them. The Harry Potter game you're also excited about, that's been delayed to next year. No date yet, just 2022. 
And I know this news is going to be hard to believe, so I hope you're sitting down for this. Star Citizen has been delayed. I know, I know, I couldn't believe it either, but it turns out that the Squadron 42 beta has been delayed with no release date provided. The good news is that this does give you more time to give more money to Chris Roberts because he really needs it. Star Citizen has just passed $300 million in crowdfunding, so clearly these guys are really strapped for cash. So if you could help them out by buying another $10,000 spaceship, that would be great. So, what came out last week? There wasn't much. It was just Scott Pilgrim Complete Edition. I haven't played it, but it's reviewing okay with high 70s on Metacritic. It's a pretty slow week. But what's coming out this week? Well, first up, Everspace 2 just hit early access on PC. I have only heard fantastic things about it, and I've watched a bunch of gameplay, and it does indeed look awesome. I'll be checking this out soon. Hitman 3 releases on January 20th. It's the conclusion to the Hitman saga and allows you to play all the previous missions from the first two games so long as you own them on that same platform. This wasn't going to be the case for PC given that Hitman 3 is an epic exclusive, but Tim Sweeney stepped in and IO have confirmed that a solution is coming so that if you already own the games on Steam, you won't have to buy the first two games on the Epic Store as well. Put this on your radar, Persona 5 Strikers is coming out next month. I just did a preview of it and it's looking awesome. It's basically a mini Persona 5 sequel, so you kind of need to have played Persona 5 to enjoy it. But if you have, then you're in for a really good time, I think. I'll leave a link to the video in the description below. The other thing you guys should check out is Returnal. Now, this is from House Marquee, the team behind Resogun and Helldivers. They know how to make a great game, and they're making a third-person sci-fi roguelike here. They've just released gameplay recently, and it's looking pretty cool. I just really trust this team to make a cool game, though, so even if the gameplay doesn't look incredible, I just think this is going to be worth keeping an eye on. Returnal is exclusive to PlayStation, and it's out on March 19th. Finally, our feel-good story of the week is the news that long, long ago, Microsoft tried to buy Nintendo. But according to Kevin Backus, the former director of third-party relations, that meeting didn't go so well. Quote, Steve Barmer made us go meet with Nintendo to see if they would consider being acquired. They just laughed their asses off. Like, imagine an hour of somebody just laughing at you. That was kind of how the meeting went. That's a cool story. It reminds me of that famous Shigeru Miyamoto quote, A delayed game is good, but one time, Microsoft tried to buy us. Lol. And that's the week in video games, ladies and gentlemen. Like I said, it's a new show, so tell me what you think. Did this suck? Should we keep doing it? Should we cancel it faster than an Amazon Studios game? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks very much. Take care of yourself. See you next time. This video was brought to you by Squarespace, the best place to build a professional looking website for your hobby, business, or just because you feel like it. Let's say you want to have a career in video games or content creation. Having your own website would be a damn good start. You could use it to profile your own artwork if you were an artist. You could showcase your best writing there if that's your thing. Or if you wanted to be a games journalist or a commentator, you could start your own blog. With Squarespace, the process is always simple. Just choose from one of their many, many professional looking templates, update it using their intuitive tools, and voila, you've got yourself a very schmick looking website in no time. There's even more advanced features like the ability to schedule posts or traffic overview analytics so you can gain insights into where the clicks are coming from. To get started, visit squarespace.com and when you're ready to get serious, visit squarespace.com forward slash skill up for a 10% discount on your first purchase of a website or a domain name. Thanks Squarespace for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it. Thanks for watching my video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down so I know to do better for next time. If you enjoyed yourself, consider subscribing. And if you really enjoyed yourself, maybe consider hitting that notification bell so you never miss a video. You can see my patrons here on the left. They're awesome. They're amazing. If you want to join them, check out my Patreon page. Thank you again. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.